Okay, so tonight we're going to be looking at chapter 6, lesson 1. We're starting off a new chapter. And the first lesson we're going to be looking at is called, What is the Work of the Holy Spirit? And uh, farther down, uh, the next nine studies will be all the different characteristics of the Holy Spirit that we'll be looking at. But tonight, we're just specifically looking at what is the work of the Holy Spirit. And um, as I was thinking about it during this week, my thought was, you know, we've all read, you know, in especially the Gospels of the Holy Spirit and the different aspects of the Holy Spirit and how it's the, our helper, our comforter, our guide, you know, the one that brings to remembrance the, the words that Jesus has spoke. But in this portion of the text that we're going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at Galatians chapter 5. And the reading is chapter or verse, verses 22 through 23. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. But here Paul gives such a contrast to the work of the Holy Spirit. The verses that we're going to be looking at reads... But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Now, prior to this, we see we hear these nine different characteristics. And prior to this, Paul was talking to the church of Galatia, who was sort of turning back into legalism. So they're getting back to the rituals and the laws and what... What Paul was trying to tell them is that they had freedom. They were no longer under this bondage of sin, this bondage of the law. And in verse 16, he says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so that's what we're going to look at tonight. How do you walk in the Spirit? How do you tap into the resources that God has given us? This helper that comes to our aid in time of prayer, in time of uh, concern, in time of distress, but Paul says, walk in the Spirit, as if this is something that we should already know and be able to put into practice. He goes on to say in verse 17, he says, for the flesh lusts against the, against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. They are both contrary to one another. In verse 19, he goes and describes all the different things that the work of the flesh is. And there are a lot of different things. Let me, I'll, I'll read a few of them to you. He says, The works of the flesh are evident, which means they, are, they can't be hidden. If I'm walking, or if I'm living in the flesh, you guys are going to be able to look at me and say, Mark, you're in the flesh. Because as he says, as he says, they are evident, and he says they're adultery, they're fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentious, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfishness, ambitions, dissensions and heresies, envy, murder, and drunkenness. So he gives a big list of these works of the flesh. And so that, that's why tonight, as we look at what is the work of the Holy Spirit, I kind of sat back and I thought, well, how did the Holy Spirit work in my life to bring me to the point to where I'm at today? And so what I want to do is I want to kind of look back at the old nature Mark's old nature, the way Mark used to be before he actually tapped into the Holy Spirit, allowing him to guide and direct him. But before we get started, let me pray real quick. Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight. Lord, we pray that you would open up our hearts, that we would hear and see what you want to teach us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the power of the Holy Spirit as we allow it into our lives to guide and to direct us, Lord to bring back to remembrance your scriptures, to be able to utilize them in time of need. And you know, Lord, in our lives, there's so many, so many times throughout the day when we need you. And just as Dave was singing, Lord, I need you. That's one of the songs that I've been singing to myself this past month. Lord, I need you. Every hour I need you. And Lord, that's how we should be, dependent upon you. Because we know that when we say that and we allow you to work in our lives, you're there to do it. And so, Lord, here we are tonight, and we do need you. So, Lord, teach us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. So what is the work of the Holy Spirit? So first I want to look at the old nature. So I'm going to look at some verses in Romans. I'm going to go through them kind of quick so you can jot them down. And these are, if we're, you know, if you're familiar, familiar with the book of Romans, the first portion of it kind of describes our old nature, the way we used to live, a sinful nature, and how God sort of gave us over to that nature, to, to our desires, our sin, sinful desires. Because God loves us. God is going to allow us to make our own choices and decisions. Because when we make that decision to follow Him, it's going to be a decision that we make ourselves. Not that one that's pressed upon us or one that's forced upon us. Our commitment to Christ, our commitment to God is going to be one that we want to make. And when we want to make it. How we want to make it and when we want to make it. Now in Romans chapter 7 verse 5, Paul says, For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit of death. And when I think back of my lifestyle, my life when I was in the world, there was nothing but death that was being brought up. I lived life for myself. I lived it to please myself, to gratify myself, the things that I wanted to do. And Paul says here that these things that were aroused by the law because Paul says, before the law was made known, he wasn't a sinner. Before there was a law, there was no sin. But Paul says when the law made itself evident, he realized that what he was doing was sin. There was a lot of sin in his life. And we, we know the law. We know the, the Bible has been given to us. And it tells us a bunch of these and those and thou shalt not do this. So we know and understand what is acceptable and what is unacceptable to God. So now that the law has been made known to us, just like it was to me, I realized that the fruit that I was bearing was fruit unto death. Because the things and the way I was living, there was only death at the end of that path. There was no life to it. Romans 3, verse 23 one of the verses that we all know, Paul says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Before we can understand the power of the Holy Spirit, we need to realize that we are sinners. If we haven't made that profession to follow Christ wholeheartedly, I mean, that means every, every bit of us, then we have fallen short. We are sinners. We are sinners by nature. Because we were born into this sinful nature because of the mistake of Adam. Adam was the first one that sinned. And because of that, we, will all, we, will all, we were all born into sin. So here we are with this sinful nature. And as Paul is describing in Romans. And in Romans chapter 7 verse 15. Paul realizes that he's a sinner. He realizes that he doesn't want to sin anymore. And he's trying to do what's right. He says in verse 15 of chapter 7, he says, For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. So what Paul is saying is, he's, I, I don't understand. I realize that the law has made itself known. I know what right is. I know what wrong is. But there's this war, again, what he talked about in Galatians, the spirit and the flesh. He says that there's this thing going on, this turmoil. When he left one battle of living out in the world, became a believer as a Christian, he faces another battle. And that's his flesh. It's still there. It's still alive. We're going to see later on that Paul wants to crucify that flesh. He wants to put it down. He wants to put it out. Of, he wants to make it out of commission. Because he says the things that he wants to do, I want to do everything that's right. I don't want to do drugs anymore. I don't want to be running around anymore. And that's the way, I, the way I was when I first came to the Lord. When I first came to Christ. I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to live the way I was. But I don't understand. That which I want to do, I don't do. And what I don't want to do, I find myself doing night after night. What is going on? I don't understand. How do I stop? And so this is the reason why we're looking at the before... Because then we're going to realize how important the Holy Spirit is in our lives. We need to be filled with the Spirit. Because when he says in Galatians that I say then, walk in the Spirit. Because he says, he says it as a command. He says, walk in the Spirit. Because there's no other way that we're going to make it. We can't do it under our own strength. And Paul is 
telling us that. And so in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Paul says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, again, as a believer, all the things that he has done in the past has been as though he didn't do it. Just if I'd never sinned. That's the word justified. To be justified of your sins means just the way it sounds. Just as if I'd never sinned before. So he says, therefore, having been justified, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, peace cannot be experienced until we've made that commitment with Christ. We can't experience the peace of God until we have actually come face to face with Him, realizing that we are sinners and allow Christ into our hearts. So he says, now that I've been justified by this faith, because all it takes is believing, but along with believing, there's a little bit of an action. And so in Romans chapter 6, verse 6, Paul says, Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that body of sin, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. So here Paul comes to that conclusion that I am going to get rid of this old man, this old nature of mine, the one that says, I want to do this and I want to do that. I am self-centered. I'm only thinking about myself. I'm only thinking about what pleases me. It doesn't really matter about anybody else. Paul is saying, I am putting that guy to death. I am crucifying him. I am putting him to death. In Romans chapter 6, verse 12, he says, Therefore, almost the same language that he uses in Galatians, he says, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. This is something that we need to do. Do not let, this is our choice, our decision, do not let it reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. So he says the same thing in Galatians. He says, walk in the Spirit so you don't fulfill the lust of flesh. This is what we get to do. This is what we get to do as believers. And now in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 to 24, Paul gives us some things that we are to put off. In Ephesians, he talks about putting off the old man, the things of the, of the old nature. He says in verse 22, he says, that you put off concerning... Your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And so in order to put on the new man, we need to remove the old man, our habits, the things that we used to do. These are the things that we can never do on our own. It's only by the work of the Holy Spirit that's going to enable us to do these things. Because he goes on and says that we, he says, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God. This is the life that God has created for us. Sometimes we believe that we have freedom in the things that we do, even though they're things that aren't right. But God has created us for life. And putting on the new man, living in the true righteousness and holiness, is what we were created to do. By God, this is that this is the way that Adam was first created, and so here we've looked at the things of that old nature, the reasons why we need the Holy Spirit. So now in Christ, in Second Corinthians chapter chapter five verse seventeen, Paul says here he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. This is Paul again. He is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So here Paul is given a little bit of a description of this new person that we are. This new creature. That old mark, the old things that he used to do, all that has been put aside. All of that has been mortified, crucified with Christ, buried with Christ. So he says, now that we are a new creation... These old things are no longer part of our lives anymore. We have a new lifestyle. We have a new way we act, a new way that we react to things. We no longer turn to those things that would make us comfortable. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Paul begs them. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, he's talking to the believers now, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice 
wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So now as new believers, there's a certain way about our life. There was new things that Mark had to do. Mark no longer hung out at the places where he used to hang out. Mark, yeah, the golden goose. Mark didn't go to the golden goose anymore. Mark had to change his relationships with friends because they were not friends that were going to build up and strengthen him spiritually, but were going to bring him down. I think uh, Colossians talks about, uh, you know, uh, uh, harmful or bad corruption. Bad company brings in corruption, something like that. But there had to be a new way about me. He says, he begs them by the mercy of God that we present. Now, again, it's us that needs to present ourselves, that needs to make ourselves known as these living sacrifices. We know back in the days of the sacrifices, before the final sacrifice, which was Jesus Christ on the cross, they would make sacrifices for the sins. There were these sacrifices that they would place on the altar and they would be completely consumed which means that it was a sacrifice unto the Lord. And now our lives are similar to those. They are no longer our lives. There are, our lives have been put on this altar and completely given to God. Completely consecrated, it says. A living sacrifice because we know that we are still alive. The choices that we make, the things that we do, are based upon what God would have for us. We are alive, but our lives have been given unto the Lord completely. He says, this is acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service. This is something that's not beyond what we should do. This is something that's so difficult that, you know, that, that some of us aren't able to do it. He says, this is reasonable because of what God has done through his son, Jesus Christ, offering him up for that final sacrifice, that it is our reasonable service to do to him or do to, to do for him, given up ourselves for him. But Paul goes on in, in verse 2 of this chapter, chapter 12. He says, and do not be conformed to this world. Again, that lifestyle is changing. Don't be so conformed to the things of this world. And when we look around us, we see the media, we see the movies, we see the music, we see the people the way they live their lives. He says, don't be conformed to this. Don't adapt yourself to this. You are a living sacrifice. Your life is new. Your life is in Christ. Don't conform to this world. Be, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the only way to renew our mind is to allow the power of the Holy Spirit to rule and reign in us. This is the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? How will we know and how will we be able to demonstrate what that good, acceptable, perfect will of God is? Because when I look around this room, I see many people who God wants to use in powerful ways. I think last week we were talking about becoming new believers. You know, giving our hearts over to Christ. We no longer do the negative things. I no longer do this and do that and the other. But the thing is, what are we doing now for him? As we've given our lives over to Christ, how do we live our lives now? What are the positive things? There's the sins of omission and the sins of commission. There's sins that we know that are completely wrong and that we shouldn't do those things. But now there's sins of omission. There's things that we should be doing that we should want to do, desire to do as believers, but we don't do. When we see something is wrong and out of place, and we don't make a stand for it, that is, in a sense, a sin. And so, it says here that we are to be transformed, that renewing our mind, and that we may demonstrate what is that perfect will of God. And so to, in order to demonstrate that, there needs to be a change in our behavior. There needs to be something that we do as well as the things that we don't do anymore. So here we have our new life in the Spirit. Transformed, renewed, not being conformed to the, the world and what it has to offer. But now God has revealed His nature to us through His Spirit and through His Word as we've been studying, as we, you've been reading 
The more you understand who Christ is and what he's done for your life, the more that we should desire to read his word. And as we read his word, that's where that transformation takes place. Amen. That's where things start to fall together. It's like, oh, I get it now. Because Christ has made himself revealed through his word. We understand what the spirit and who, what, who the spirit is and what he wants to do in our lives. We realize that we are to live lives that are pure and holy. It says in 1 Peter, let me turn there. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 16. But I want to read a couple of verses in front of it. In verse 14 it says, As obedient children, not conform yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. So Christians are to take on that nature and grow to be more and more like God. That's what our ultimate desire is. That's what our ultimate goal is. We should continue, we should be growing daily. These sinful natures, these habits, these things that we were involved with should be diminishing little by little by little. As we are growing more and more to be Christ-like, these habits, these temptations should be diminishing. And so we as believers now should be taking on the nature of Christ. And now we're going to look at the Holy Spirit and what His job is. Because the thing is, how do we? become holy. How do we do what's right? So here we're going to look at the Holy Spirit and his job. Because we because as we look at John, we're going to be looking at John and it says that he is the comforter, the helper, and the counselor. So first of all, in John chapter 14 verse 16, Jesus says, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. So we know as Christ was here on earth, he was that helper. He was the one that did all the miracles, that taught his disciples, that taught the apostles, that did all the he healing and fed all the different people. But he says that I will pray to the Father, and that he will give you another helper, which will abide with you forever. He will abide with us. We know the scripture in John chapter 15 verse 5 says, He says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. If, you, if anyone abideth in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. But without him, we can, he can do nothing. Without Christ, we can do nothing. What it's saying there is that he is our lifeline. He is the vine. We are just the branches. In order for us to produce any fruit in our lives, we need to have that nourishment. We need to have that bloodline going through us. So here we see that he is going to be the helper. That he may abide with us forever. It doesn't say that he's just going to pop in every now and then. But Jesus says that he will abide with us forever. This is the promise that we have. This is why we're looking to the Holy Spirit because he's going to be there in any and every situation that we're going to find ourselves in this week, this coming up week. He's going to be that helper. When we just go, "Oh man, I don't know what to do here, this temptation or this trial or whatever it might be. What am I going to do?" Well, here it's telling us that the Holy Spirit is there with us to help us. In chapter 16, verse 7 of John, he says, Jesus says again here, he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. This is not a lie. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Again, we know that Jesus had to go. He had to go to the Father after being crucified. But he says again that there's going to be a helper. There's going to be somebody that's going to come alongside. And he needs to leave in order for the Holy Spirit to be able to not only to come alongside of us, but also to dwell in us. 
There's going to be something we're going to talk about, being filled with the Holy Spirit, being overtaken by the Holy Spirit, where all we want to do is exactly what the Word of God says. He's there to remind us. So we saw he was there to help us. Here, now we're going to see that he's here to remind us. Uh, verse 14, chapter 14, verse 26 of John. He says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. This is going to come in handy when we're looking for the scripture because we're either talking to somebody, witnessing to someone, or maybe we're looking for a scripture that's going to help us get, out, get us out of a situation that we're in. But here, I know one of the hardest things that I had was learning the word of God, was trying to memorize it in a way that if I didn't have a Bible present with me, I could still meditate on it. But here we see that Jesus is going to leave the Holy Spirit so that he can be the one to enable us to understand, not only to, to remember the scriptures, but to, to be able to understand them in the way that we can teach them to others, in a, in a way that we can utilize them to help us out of the situations that we find ourselves in. We're going to see that they're here, that the Holy Spirit is here to guide. In John chapter 16, verse 13, Jesus says here, he says, However, when he, the Holy Spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. So here we see even the Holy Spirit, part of the Trinity, he's still under the authority of God. We know that the things that the Holy Spirit is here to teach us is what God has to say with us. So yes, it's going through a mediator in a sense, but the words is coming directly from God. But it says here that he will guide you into all truth. Isn't that powerful? How many of us want to be guided in truth? How, you know, one of the things that's most important about a person's characteristic is his integrity or her integrity. That's one of the most important things of a person. I mean, that's one of the things that are going to bring about friendships, trust, whether it's in relationships, whether it's with the spouse, whether it's with the children. Here he says he's going to guide us in all truth. How many of us have had difficulty with integrity, with truth? The belt of truth. That's one of the things we looked at in Ephesians. Because our life should be surrounded with sincerity. And that's one of the most difficult things. I know it was for me when I was out in the world. Before I became a believer. Before I became a Christian. Half the things that came out of my mouth were probably a lie. So here it says that the Holy Spirit is here to guide us into all truth. And He's only going to speak what the Word of God wants to speak to us. Everything that He hears from the Father is going to be declared to us. And He will tell you things to come. Isn't that amazing? Being able to be given some type of prophecy. Being able to know what's going to take place. That's some of the things that, hey, I mean, when they have prophecy conferences, that's one of the things that amazes me the most. How people, how these intellectuals, study the Word of God and dig into it so deep that, you know, as we read Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Daniel, we almost can tell by looking at the things going on in our world how close we are to the soon coming of, of Christ when He comes for us. You know, when we look at all the different things that are going on in the countries, or especially around Israel, you know, it says, keep your eyes on Israel, keep your eyes on Damascus. You know, when, it, when you see it as a ruin, an uninhabited, that to look up. You know, these are the seasons that, that Jesus would tell his disciples to look at. You know, you, we know the seasons. We know that when it gets windy, we know fall is coming around, you know. And so when we see these things taking place around us, we know that Christ is coming back soon. And one of the, and one of the ultimate things that the Holy Spirit is here to do, and what we're looking at in Galatians, is to produce and cultivate the characteristics of Christ Himself. And that's one of the most important things, and one of the things that we're looking at tonight. The Holy Spirit is here to 
to produce the characteristics of Christ himself. And that's why it says in verse 22 of Galatians chapter 5, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such there is no law. Right here, they've just given the characteristics of Christ himself. And just like the flesh will be made evident, if I'm living my life in a fleshly way, the same is to be said about walking in the Spirit. If I am walking in the Spirit, if I am being, if these things are being produced in my life, love, joy, and peace, you're going to be, they're, you're going to tell that I am walking in the Spirit. But if I am doing anything contrary to these things, you're going to see that I'm in the flesh. But when we look at here, we see the difference between fruit being singular and works being plural. Because it says the fruit of the Spirit are these nine different characteristics. So many people get mixed up with this. They think it's the fruits of the Spirit. But actually, it's one fruit. It's like one orange. And when it's peeled, these nine different characteristics come from it. The works of the flesh... And it's funny that they use works because it takes effort. It takes effort to do things that aren't right. It takes effort to live a life that is outside of God's will. I mean, you know the work that it takes. Yeah, it takes some sweat, right? But here, the fruit, it comes naturally. We have no say in that cultivation process. This is the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. If I am walking in accordance to what the Word of God says, love, joy, and peace, it's going to come naturally. It's going to be cultivated, it's going to be produced, and it's going to grow in my life. Not just not for me to experience or to enjoy, but just like a fruit tree, it's for others to enjoy. If I'm walking in the Spirit and I'm demonstrating this love, joy, and peace, it's going to be enjoyed by those who come in contact with me. But if I am producing the works of the flesh, guess what? It's not just us that we're, that we're, uh, that, that we're messing up, but the people that are around us are going to be, uh, are going to be the result, or they're, going to, uh, they're the ones that are going to be affected by the works of the flesh. So here, the nine characteristic qualities of the Spirit form these three triads. These groups of three things are closely related. We see the first three, which are love, joy, and peace, which have to do with ourself. You know, having joy within our, having love and having peace. The second triad is the horizontal, because this is the way that we treat others, which is long-suffering, which is seen as patience, kindness, and goodness. And the third, the third triad, the third three, is faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And these are the things that are demonstrated towards God. So we see the first ones are, are within ourselves. Love, joy, and peace. And then with those around us that experience long-suffering, kindness, and goodness. And then those that are directed towards God, which are faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, these are attributes of a Christian's life, as we've been saying. These Nine characteristics are God's or Christ's characteristics. This means that when the Holy Spirit is completely controlling our lives, these are the things that are going to be produced within us. The Holy Spirit is going to produce these nine characteristics. But if we are being run by the flesh or the control of the flesh, we can see, as Paul demonstrated, that he gave that contrast of walking or the work of the flesh. So fruit of the Spirit is physical, a physical manifestation of Christians' transformed life. Again, these are lives that have completely devoted and given themselves to the Lord. And when you look at these people, you can see these characteristics. You can see this fruit growing within them. Because when we were, again, non-believers, non-Christians, not following the Lord, it was very hard to love, right? Sometimes we wonder, why is it so hard to love people? 
Why is it so hard to have peace? You know, I'm always restless. I can't sleep. You know, why don't I have joy in my life? Well, because the Holy Spirit is not cultivating these things within our lives. And that's why it's so important to know what the work of the Holy Spirit is in with our lives. If we want to be able to sleep, we want to be able to rest, we want to have the joy, and we're going to be looking at all these nine characteristics in the future, how important they are in our lives, and how they demonstrate God working within us, or the Holy Spirit, these are the things that can only come from Him as we have given ourselves completely. I mean completely. We looked at the things that Paul was talking about. A living sacrifice. We have placed our life on the altar and said, you know what, God, I am done with trying to run and rule my life. I have done a bad job of it. I want you to do it because I want that joy. Not only within myself, but I want to be able to demonstrate that so others can have or sense or be able to partake in that fruit in my life. I want to be loving. I want to be happy. And I want to be at peace. When Christ truly has become the center of our lives, we are set free to live and to serve. Again, it's not just to become believers, but there's a reason. Because God wants to use us in ministry. And it might not be a big ministry. It might not be, I mean, it could be. But it could be a ministry within our own families, within our own children, within our own neighbors. In order to experience this freedom, we need to free ourselves from our self-centeredness. Because that's what the works of the flesh are. It's wanting so much to have it our way. Not wanting to yield to others. Not caring about others' needs above ourselves. Like the Bible says. And that's what Jesus taught. As he demonstrated his life coming here on earth to sacrifice himself completely. And that's the best demonstration of sacrifice that we could ever follow. Completely given of himself for others. And so here we see that Paul believed that as long as we were self-serving, focusing on the flesh, we were not free. And that's why he reminds us here in Galatians, in chapter 5, that we were created for freedom. And that's why I was, kind of went over the first the beginning of it, the laws. Because he opens up in verse 1 of chapter 5. He says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Again, this is freedom that we have now. We no longer have to be controlled by our sin nature because that isn't freedom. To do what we want to do, whether it's right or wrong, is not freedom. Because ultimately, what it does is it brings us back into those shackles. The things that held us back. But here, Paul is saying that we were created for freedom. That we have been set free, not from something, but for something. To live, to serve, and to transform the world. Because that's what we're created for. We've been commissioned to be disciples. So not only have we been set free from something, but we've been set free for something. And that's why I'm always encouraging that, yes, once we have been freed of those things that held us back, let's see what Christ has for us. Let's see what God has for us. Fruit is something produced by living organisms, such as trees or vines. Now, human beings can produce living organisms, and we call them children, right? The character of the fruit comes from the organism that produced it. Like our children, which take on the characteristics that we or our spouse have. Now, wouldn't you like to have people say that we resemble God when they see us, right? Just as we take on the characteristics of, you know, our, of our fathers, our mothers, our fathers, even some relatives, right? Now, wouldn't we want to resemble, when people look at us, resemble God? Or when they see us, that we are Christ-like? Because in Acts chapter 4, verse 13... It says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John 
and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. So even there, these are ignorant, unlearned fishermen. But here the people at the synagogue, when they heard Peter talking, and Peter and John talking, they thought, wait a second, these guys shouldn't be speaking like this. These guys shouldn't understand the scriptures. That was probably the Old Testament that they were talking about. Isaiah, maybe. The Pentateuchs. But it says that they marveled. And they took knowledge. They realized, well, this guy's been hanging out with someone. These guys have been hanging out with Jesus. So when we are hanging out with Jesus, we start to resemble Jesus himself. This is that work of the Holy Spirit. We start to take on the characteristics of what we do the most. And you can look at a person or you can talk with a person for a few minutes and you can tell what, who they've been hanging out with the past week. You can understand what they've been doing in a sense, right? So walking in fellowship with the Spirit yields the fruit of the Spirit. The Christian does not produce this fruit. He is not the source of the fruit, but the Holy Spirit Himself. This is the Holy Spirit again. This is the work of Him. We have nothing to do with this. As believers or as non-believers, sometimes we can fake some of these characteristics. We might be able to love someone for a few minutes, maybe an hour or two, maybe a couple days, I don't know, right? But... We can't fake all nine characteristics. And just like as we are filled with the Spirit and walking in the Spirit and allowing the work to do and to work and to cultivate these characteristics in our life, all nine of these are going to be evident in our lives. And so we can fake maybe one or two of them for a while, but we can't fake all nine of them. They don't, we don't just get one without the other. You don't just say, well, I'm going to you know, get filled with the Spirit. I'm going to work on love. You know, and then wait for the Lord to work on peace and joy somewhere down the line. Now, it says here that we have no control over this. If we're doing what we should be doing, if we are completely transformed, the renewing of our mind, we're in the Scriptures, we're not doing those things, we're putting off the things of the old, the old man, we're crucifying it, we're wrecking it dead. We are that sacrifice on the altar, completely given up of ourselves. If we allow the Holy Spirit to do the work which it is called to do and wants to do in our lives and has been left for that purpose, it is working in our lives and these nine characteristics are going to just start just like fruit in our lives. Now it might not be all ripe and everything, there might be some rough edges and corners in our life, but it's going to start producing. Sometimes we get mixed up with the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit are some of the things that God has given us, talents, you know, some of the things that we can work on. God might have given me a talent playing baseball, and who knows, maybe I could have worked it into, uh, uh, you know, into fruition, something better, and I could have been a professional baseball player, and I could have used that to glorify God. You know, you see some of the professional baseball, football, musicians, you know, sometimes when they win, they, you know, or make a touchdown, they point up to heaven, giving that glory to God. Now, these are certainly talents and gifts that God has given us that we can work on. You know, musicians, you know, we got, you know, Val and Dave up here. These are things that we can work on. But the fruit of the Spirit isn't something that we can work on. It is given to us in seed format. It's given to us as a seed. And it's only cultivated, it's only watered by the Holy Spirit. That's what His job is to do. And as He waters it, as we continue on doing what we should be doing... Staying in fellowship, staying in prayer, staying in the Word, staying in studying. This is where that fruit starts to ripen. It starts to ripen on that tree, and guess what? Those around us, they see it. And they think, wow, Mark's been hanging out with Jesus because, you know, I see some fruit there. And it's going to be enjoyed by those around me. It's going to be enjoyed by my family. It's going to be enjoyed by my friends. When people come in contact with me, they're going to say, man, this... This is a nice tree to be around. And that's what we want to be. Because as that opens up, then our ministries start to open up. Remember last week, I think we were talking about Paul, who was saying that I, um, 
I discipline my body and I bring it under submission. Literally, he's saying, I give the flesh black eyes. You know, I knock it out. This is what he's saying. Now, I don't want you to come in next week with black eyes. But that's what he's saying. He's saying that he's beating up that flesh and he's disciplining it. He's training it up. Because when he communicates, when he has preached to others, he doesn't want to be disqualified. Our ministry is disqualified when we're talking about what we should be doing, but we're not living that way. So here, our ministries start to open up as we allow the Holy Spirit to produce this fruit in our lives. And again, these are attributes, characteristics that we really want. Because again, we want that love, joy, and peace. We want to have that patience, long-suffering. And again, this is not patience that we have as we're waiting for the water to boil so we can put our spaghetti in there. But this long-suffering deals with people. It's being patient under stress, especially when it comes to people. So, a spirit-filled believer always manifests a unity of nine character qualities. He does not love at the exclusion of inner peace. Again, you can't have one without the other. They all come together. They all come, they, they all are manifested, are produced, cultivated by the Holy Spirit. So the idea here is one of complete submission to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's like having nine grapes hanging together in one cluster that come from a spirit-filled life. And so the principle to this is realizing and knowing that the Holy Spirit is the source of the fruit. He is the one that does the work in our lives. So as we close up, again, I just want to read to you again, verse 22 to 23. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. These are the characteristics of God, and these are the same characteristics or attributes that will be given to us. As we start hanging out with Jesus, as we, again, continue on in fellowship, the things that we used to do, and this is what he says, this is, verse 16, walking in the Spirit. Because if we are walking in the Spirit, if we're allowing the Holy Spirit to run our lives, we are not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. This war that's going on in our lives, our spirit's going to be much stronger. And when those trials, when those temptations... When those days when we don't want to be loving, when we don't have peace, we're going to be able to rely upon the Holy Spirit for these things. So that's why he says, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So I continue to encourage all of you, one of the things that we need to do the most is stay in the Word of God. Staying with the Word of God, studying, staying in prayer, staying in fellowship, and again, staying with like-minded people. People that are going to build up, strengthen. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your Word. We thank you, Lord, for the power of the Holy Spirit. And we ask, Lord, that we would be those men and women who would allow you to rule and reign in our lives. And Lord, we pray that we wouldn't allow our flesh to take control. Lord, that we would be led into doing things that we shouldn't be doing. And so, Lord, I pray that you would empower my brothers and sisters here, Lord, that you would give them the overflow of the Holy Spirit, Lord, that they would be entrenched with it, Lord, that they would be those that produce fruits that would be enjoyed by their families, Lord. So, Lord, go before us as we break up into groups. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.